Well, good morning. Welcome to Hawkinsville, First United Methodist Church on this Sunday morning. I'm glad that you're all here today. Uh, judging by the sparse crowd that we have here, I think everybody can have their own pew if you want to spread out. You can sit in your own pew and, and lay down in your own pew if that's what you feel like doing. But I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad you made the choice to be in worship this morning. I also want to welcome our online uh, audience. We're glad that you guys are worshiping with us as well, and we hope that you're doing well at home. Uh, as a church, I like to say that our church has a mission. Our mission is to worship Jesus, to grow in our holiness, and to serve the world. So uh, may we be about God's mission for us as the church this morning. May we be open to God and his presence here in this place. May we be open to becoming the people that he wants us to be. If you'll take a look at your bulletin, we have a few announcements. Uh, inside today, we're going to have our churchwide picnic and cornhole tournament at 4 o'clock. And everybody's invited to come to that. We're going to have a great time of uh, fellowship and fun, so we hope to see you all there. No reservations required and no skill required. So I hope that you'll come and check out the cornhole tournament and be a part of that this afternoon. Also, our uh, Wednesday afternoon kick program began this past Sunday. And I think y'all had, what y'all have, 12 kids? 13 kids on their first one, so if you know of anybody else who wants to participate in the kick program, they can uh, sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. You could take that to them, and they could be a part of that wonderful program as well. Also, if you would like to help uh, furnish a supper for our youth program, uh, you can actually uh, give supper to them, uh, make it or, or buy it from somewhere, or you can give money, make a donation for supper. So if you want to help our youth program, that's a great way to get involved. Also, the new upper rooms are outside, available in the narthex. You can get those on your way out. You'll also see in your bulletin a note from Miss Nancy Pritchett in there. She's back in the office. Uh, she's thanking everybody for your love and your support. And I'm so grateful to have Nancy back. Uh, we determined that she was out for 11 weeks, which is a long time. And I really missed her, so I'm glad that she's back in the office and she's doing such a great job for us. And I want to say a special thank you to somebody who helped me a lot during those 11 weeks, and that's Miss Kara Turk. Miss Kara helped to make all the bulletins during that time. So if you enjoyed your bulletins, Kara's the one to thank. So thank you so much for that, Kara. I appreciate that. Uh, she has a lot of artistic uh, ability. I have no artistic ability. So she was able to do a lot of good stuff with the bulletin, and we appreciate all her help with that. Well, I want to mention that the flowers on the altar this morning are given to the glory of God and in celebration of the 31st anniversary of Derek and Lisa Dykes and the 56th anniversary of Alton and Vicki Dykes. Thank you so much for those. Uh, anniversary is August 25th. It is the 31st anniversary of Derek and Lisa. And August the 28th is the 56th anniversary of Don and Beth Wells. I think Alton and Vicki, y'all's is next Sunday, I think, so we'll celebrate that next Sunday. And then uh, birthdays, August the 26th, there's some bozo named Jack Varnell on there. His birthday is coming up. Uh, Jack's going to be 36, so he's looking forward to his 36th birthday. And uh, August 28th, we have Miss Jane Cradle, Kara Turk, and Bailey McLeod. Happy uh, birthday and happy anniversary to all of you guys this week. Now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Barbara for our worship this morning. Our hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, and we will stand and sing together according to the words that you see on the screen.
you remain standing, I invite you to join me in this affirmation of faith found in the Apostles' Creed. Here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can get your steps in this morning because you're going to have to walk around to find somebody to talk to. So take some time to greet one another and welcome each other to church today. Morning, choir. How are y'all? Morning, y'all. Do you want me to or you want to start? I'll say something. All right, before we move into our time of prayer, I'm going to invite Miss Linda Williams to come forward, and Linda is going to make a presentation about the ALS walk. Linda? Thank you, Jack, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you a few minutes about the ALS walk to defeat the walk to defeat ALS. You have ALS. Those are no words that no one wants to hear. ALS is a rare neurodegenerative disease. There is no cure. The incidence of ALS in the United States is estimated to be two per 100,000. Two members of our 366 member congregation have heard those words. We will be walking this year on September 25th in memory of Paul and in honor of Judy Jones. The walk has taken place in Atlanta for 20 years, but because of COVID last year, we had a mini walk here at the church. This year, once again, the walk to defeat ALS will be in Atlanta at the Georgia State Stadium, which is the old turn of field. I want to say thank you to those of you who have already donated to the walk to defeat ALS in memory of Paul. As I said earlier, we're also walking in honor of Judy. Many of you have also donated to the Paul B. Williams ALS Transportation Program. This is an area of designated giving, which means that all monies for the transportation program go directly to the program. As you may recall, this program provides at no cost to patients accessible van rentals and non-emergency transport for ALS patients living in Georgia. I learned just yesterday in a support group Zoom meeting 
that several ALS patients have handicap accessible vans re reserved so that they can attend the walk. Otherwise, they could not be there. Your donations to the walk will allow the Georgia chapter to manage all of its programs, including the Paul B. Williams ALS Transportation Program, and funds for research to find a cure. In 2014, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge raised $115 million, with 80% of it going towards research. As a result, a new drug, Rylazol, was developed to help slow the progression of ALS. And Rylazol is benefiting Judy today. In our walk to defeat ALS, we are coming together to raise awareness of the disease, raise money for those living with ALS, and to ultimately have a world without ALS. There are flyers on the table in the back of the sanctuary that give more information about the walk that we'll, we, we will be walking in memory of Paul and in honor of Judy. Our, our church has accepted donations for the walk in cash, check, or online. If you choose to make a donation with a check, you may make it payable to Hawkinsville First United Methodist Church with a note that it is for the walk. There are also flyers and envelopes on the back table. Online, you may donate to the general fund and note that it is for the walk to defeat ALS. My family and I have been so blessed to have the love of this church. Again, thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for people living with ALS. Thank you, Ms. Linda, for all that you do for this great and worthy cause, and we thank you so much. And I want to thank this church for so much generosity that you've shown to the ALS Foundation over the years. Uh, sadly, it's become personal to everybody in this church, and we hate that. And uh, we're so thankful for Paul's memory. And Judy, we love you. We thank you. And we're praying for you and lifting you up during this time as well. But uh, now let's move into our time of prayer, and I invite you to bow your heads as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time and this place, this place where we get to come and meet with you, this place where your love is poured out on us anew, this place where we hear your word and are transformed by your word. What a blessing to be here today. What a blessing to be near you. Lord, we don't come today pretending to be perfect people. Uh, we name our sins before you in our hearts this morning. We confess our wrongdoing. We look to you, the giver of all mercy and grace. We look for your forgiveness, and we know that you give your forgiveness so freely today. But even though your forgiveness is free, we also know that it came about with a cost. The cost was your son Jesus dying on the cross for us and for our salvation. The cost was Christ taking the punishment that should have been ours. The cost was the Messiah doing for us what we could never do for ourselves, making things right with you, making us whole, bringing us up from the pit. Holy Spirit, help us to keep our eyes on Christ this morning, for he is the reason that we're here. He is amazing, and he has done marvelous things for us, things we don't deserve, things we have not earned, things we could never pay him back for. All we can do today is worship. All we can do is praise him. All we can do is open our hearts to following him as our Lord and our King. Lord, we know that we tend to lose our focus from time to time. We tend to take our gaze off of Jesus and we start to look at other people, other ideas, other ways of being in the world. May we refocus this morning. May we refocus on Christ his love, his goodness, and his mercy. For he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our everything. He deserves it all and so much more. We love you, Father. 
We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Come and dwell in our midst. Our lives belong to you. We make this prayer in Jesus' name as we pray now together the great prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As Mike comes forward, we're going to move into our time of offering. Uh, The offering is when we are able to give back to God for all that he's given to us. We're able to bless him with our gifts and ask that he will bless our gifts for the service of his world. Let us pray. Almighty God, we do thank you for all that you have done for us. You've given us so much, and we give back to you today. And we ask that you will use these gifts, use them to bless your church, use them to bless your community, use them to bless your world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. you may be seated.
Thank you, Barbara and Choir, for that fantastic anthem. Was anybody else tapping their toes out there during that music? That was a toe tapper there. That was fantastic. Thank you all so much for that today. I love a toe tapper before the sermon because it wakes everybody up before the sermon, which is fantastic. So now if you go to sleep, it's my fault at this point, but hopefully you'll stay awake. Well, because I've had to move a lot with my job as a pastor I've had to renew my driver's license several different times. And you can imagine all the fun that that entails. Going down to the place, picking up a number, realizing that your number is like 80 numbers from being called and you're going to be there a long time. And sometimes you go, you finally get up there to the desk and you realize you don't have the right paperwork and you have to come back and do it all again another day. And, of course, I always get just a wonderful, wonderful picture on my driver's license. Uh, Don't you just love your driver's license picture? That's the one you want to get a portrait of and hang it above your mantle because it's such a good picture. If uh, anybody here loves their driver's license picture, please show it to us after church so that we can celebrate that somebody got a good picture out of it. Well, Other than that lovely picture, you'll also see something else on my license. You'll see that the name Jack is nowhere to be found on my driver's license. That's because my name is not actually Jack. That is a nickname that was given to me by my parents. It was a family nickname. They gave it and passed it on to me. My name is actually James Clayton. James Clayton. And I love the name Clayton, so when I got old enough to realize what happened, I told my parents, I said, you blew it. It was right there in the name, and you didn't call me what would have been a fantastic name. And I love to give my parents a hard time about this now. I get a kick out of it. They don't like it very much, but I enjoy it quite a bit. And they're watching right now. They're probably shaking their heads in disgust that I'm even mentioning it in front of everybody. Now, perhaps the most important person in the New Testament outside of Jesus was the Apostle Paul. And just like me, the Apostle Paul, he also had this double name thing as well. 
When you're reading through the Bible, sometimes you'll see the name Saul. Sometimes you'll see the name Paul. They were both the same guy. He just had two names and went by both names at different points in his life. So I'm not alone in this whole double name thing. But more important than the name of Paul or Saul is what he has to say about mercy in our text for today. Mercy. Maybe something that I could have a little more of when I'm teasing my parents about messing up my name. Mercy. I invite us to hear God's word today from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Paul says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, first of all, let's remember what kind of guy Paul was. Paul grows up as a a very religious Jewish man who sought to live by the law in everything that he did. So when this new group of believers comes around calling themselves Christians and worshiping Jesus as God, worshiping Jesus as the Messiah, he's not a very happy guy. And so he takes it upon himself to persecute this new group. Now, we don't know if, if Paul ever killed any Christians himself, but he certainly stood by and watched it happen. And Paul would even lock up Christians in jail and in prison. Paul says of his treatment of Jesus here, he says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But then something happened. This violent man has a change of heart. What could have happened to bring that about? What could have possibly changed his mind from persecuting Christians to actually becoming one. And not only did he become a Christian, he became like a great evangelist, a wonderful missionary going out to all the known world at the time. What happened? Well, Paul encounters Jesus Christ. Or better yet, Jesus Christ reveals himself to Paul. Paul meets the resurrected Lord, and he comes to the realization that Jesus really is the Messiah, That he really is the Lord and that faith in God now centers around Christ. And Paul's whole world got turned upside down. You see, Paul thought that he was on the right side. He thought he was on God's team doing the right thing by persecuting the Christians. But then he meets the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he realizes, "Uh uh-oh, I'm playing for the wrong team. I'm doing the wrong thing. Jesus really is who they say he is. Paul realized that the Jesus who died and and went into that tomb was actually raised from the dead by God the Father. Now, I wouldn't blame Jesus if he had just struck Paul down right then and there on the Damascus Road. That's probably what Paul deserved, just go ahead and be exterminated right there because of all the bad things he had done to Christians. But second, what I want us to look at is what Jesus does for Paul instead. Jesus doesn't strike Paul down. Instead, he changes his life. Paul says that Jesus gave him strength. He considered him trustworthy. He appointed Paul to his service. In other words, Paul got a new mission from God. Paul says in our text, I received mercy. Now, one of the greatest movies of all time, and this is not for argument, this is not up for debate, is the 1984 classic movie, The Karate Kid. 
Y'all ever seen The Karate Kid? I love The Karate Kid. There's even a, a sequel TV show now on Netflix, and it is a fantastic show, Cobra Kai. I love Cobra Kai. I don't know if you've seen that or not. But in the movie, in Karate Kid, you have Mr. Miyagi training the good guy, Daniel LaRusso, to win the big karate tournament. And then on the other side, you had this this evil villain karate teacher named Mr. Kreese. And he's teaching his students to to be bad, to cheat, to do whatever they have to do to win. And one day, Kreese is instructing his students when he tells them these words. He says, we do not train to be merciful here. Mercy is for the weak. Here or or in the streets or in competition, if somebody comes at you, they are your enemy. And an enemy deserves no mercy. I'm really glad that Jesus doesn't talk like that. Aren't you? Giving us no mercy. Giving us no forgiveness, no grace. Two different times here, Paul says, I received mercy. Mercy. It's interesting. You'll notice that the title of the sermon was The Weight of Mercy. And the more I thought about it this week, I realized that that mercy comes to us, but it also is kind of weighty. Mercy comes to us with a responsibility. Mercy comes to us with a mission. Here, Paul knows that he has received mercy and he's grateful for it. But Jesus looks at Paul and he sees something more than what he is right now. Jesus looks at Paul and sees what he can be in the future. Jesus sees what is possible for Paul if he follows after Christ. And Paul lives into that. I love that he describes himself here. He says, hey guys, I'm not that way anymore. This is who I used to be. Maybe you have something in your life that you think excludes you from mercy. Maybe you have something in your life that you feel counts you out of the kingdom of God. Something in your past. Or maybe something right here in your present. But whatever it is that you feel counts you out, Paul is the one who reminds all of us that it's possible for someone to say, Yeah, that's who I used to be, but not anymore. Formerly, that's who I was, but now I am brand new. All because of God's mercy. Pastor Martin Thielen tells about an older man named Gus. Gus was diagnosed with this inoperable cancer, and so he went to live at a hospice facility for the rest of the life that he had left. And Gus was a bitter, fearful, angry old man, And he had always lived his life that way, but even more now after his diagnosis. Well, every day the the, the nurses at the facility would love him. They would take care of Gus. They would show him mercy even when he was not the nicest man in the world. He was still bitter, though. He was still angry. One day he was walking around the facility, and he noticed this five-year-old kid there in one of the rooms. He couldn't believe this, and so he asked one of the nurses, he said, hey, what's going on with that five-year-old kid? This is a place where old people come to die, not a place for a child to be in here. And the nurse explained that the child had had a falling accident, was paralyzed below the waist. She could not talk. She could not see. However, she was able to hear and respond to simple instructions. And Gus just stared at her through the doorway, and he couldn't fathom how something like this would happen. He said, she's only five years old. He later learned that her parents lived 600 miles away and they could only come during the weekend, so nobody was there with her during the week. And so the next morning, Gus went to the child's room again and said, hey, who's taking care of this kid? And one of the nurses shouted back, maybe you ought to do that. And he was shocked at the thought. He said, I'm not going to take care of this kid. This is not my kid. This is not my responsibility. But later on that evening, The thought was still in his mind, and so Gus put on his slippers, and he went down to her room, and he said hello to her, but there was no response. He tried speaking to her again, but there was nothing there. Finally, he reached out and touched her hand and took hold of her fingers, and that's when she squeezed back. And in that moment, Gus was transformed. For weeks, Gus and that little girl would start to to talk to each other through their handshakes, 
And he would read her stories. He would play her favorite music so she could hear. And he found uh, this little red wagon and would put her in it safely and take her all around the hospice facility for rides around the place. And as this time, they grew closer and closer together. One of the head nurses said that when Gus finally died, he died smiling. Because he was no longer Gus, the bitter, fearful, angry old man. He was now Gus, the friend of a five-year-old. Wow. It seems to me that Gus got caught up in mercy. And through mercy, he was transformed. And what's really cool to me is that when people get caught up in mercy like Gus, when people get caught up in mercy like Paul, they then become people who extend mercy to someone else. They become agents of mercy, expanding the circle of mercy to those around them. So my third point, Hawkinsville First, is this. I want to ask you today, have you been caught up in mercy? Has the love and the grace of Jesus Christ made its way into your life? Paul says, I received mercy. Paul received mercy from Jesus. He received mercy from the other Christians who took him in. And here's the truth that we learned today. Mercy received turns into mercy delivered to others. Mercy received turns into mercy delivered to others. Well, Paul then says something that's so important that even if you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear verse 15. Paul says the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. And I am the foremost of those. This is a key teaching of the New Testament in Jesus. This is the one thing that you can never doubt. You can never disbelieve this. And so if you have something to write on when you go home, I want you to write out this verse. I want you to put it in your bathroom mirror so you can see. Put it around your house so you can see that Jesus, God in the flesh, the Messiah, the Lord, came to save sinners. Paul says that he was the foremost of sinners. Maybe you felt that way about yourself. Maybe you think that you're the number one sinner. But Paul gets called up in mercy from Jesus. Paul gets called up in this good news, and his life is transformed forever. Mercy received turns into mercy delivered to somebody else. Well, as we hear the good news this morning, as we encounter the God who gives us mercy, Jesus wants us to go out and distribute mercy to someone else. Mercy to our enemies, Mercy to those who maybe talked about us behind our back. Mercy to the spouse who just keeps doing annoying things around the house. Mercy to the waitress who's just trying her best. Mercy to the guy who who cuts us off in traffic and doesn't even care. Mercy to those who are different from us. Leonard Sweet is a United Methodist pastor, and he gave one of the best definitions of the gospel that I've ever heard. He said that Jesus came to eat good food with bad people. Jesus came to eat good food with bad people. Isn't that awesome? Jesus didn't come for the people who had it all together. He didn't come for the ones who thought they were perfect. He came for the sinners, The bad people, the worst of the worst, the messed up people, the violent persecutors like Paul. It comes for people like you and me. But did you know that Jesus doesn't stop there? He doesn't just want to have me. He doesn't just want to have you. He wants to have everybody. Jesus means to have the whole world in his hands. And so we are meant to pass on mercy to others. So that they can know Jesus Christ as well. One of the best ways to see if you've received mercy is if you start passing mercy to other people. And so I want you to think about that today. Are we, are we delivering mercy to somebody else? Are we seeking out those who are far from God? Those who are sinners? Not to condemn them, not to shame them, but to show them the mercy of Christ? 
What if that is what we were known for? What if that was our reputation around town? What if Hawkinsville First Methodist was so filled with mercy that new people were just streaming in here all the time? That's a vision that can become a reality if that's what we want. Paul sounds like he's come a long way from the man who was persecuting Christians, doesn't he? Jesus had changed Paul's life. And you might be sitting here listening to all this and thinking, well, good for Paul, but what about me? Could Jesus really love even a sinner like me? Well, here's the good news of the gospel. Not only could Jesus love a sinner like you, Jesus, in fact, does love a sinner like you. John Wesley was the founder of our Methodist church and our Methodist movement, and he was a religious man early in his life. He did a lot of good deeds. He knew that God loved the whole world and that Jesus came to save the lost, but he never really knew about God loving him personally. And maybe you can understand what he was going through. One night, John Wesley went to a Bible study, and suddenly it all came together. It all clicked, and he got it. He understood He went home and wrote in his diary that night. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley had all the right answers. He knew all the correct theology, But there came a time where all that right answers, all that correct theology had to make its way to his heart so that John Wesley could say that Jesus loved even a sinner like him. I got to confess that I went through something like that in my own life as well. You know, I grew up in the church, coming to church every single Sunday, but then, you know, really wondering, does God really love me? Like, I know he loves everybody, but does he love me? And I remember being a freshman in college and coming home to a revival week that uh, this great preacher, Dr. Bill Henson, one of the best preachers that South Georgia has ever sent out, he was preaching that week, and it was fantastic. And I remember during one of the nights, during one of those sermons, suddenly it all came real for me. And I realized that Jesus loves me. Jesus has forgiven my sins. Jesus died for me. And today, I I want you to know that same love that Jesus has for you. I want you to know it, and I want you to believe it. I want you to get in on God's eternal life right here and now. Know that God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Know that you matter to God. Know that you are worth something to our Lord. And then turn around and follow him with everything you have within you. John Wesley, Paul, myself, we all experienced mercy. Mercy propelled those other guys to take the good news out into the world. But what about us today? Will mercy transform us? Will mercy propel us forward? Will mercy send us outward into the great adventure of living for Jesus Christ? I think it will. Yeah. I think it will. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your mercy in this place today. Your mercy that welcomes sinners like us. Your mercy that loves sinners like us. We are so thankful. Lord, we want to dwell in your mercy today. We want to live in your mercy. We want your mercy to get inside of us and change us from the inside out so that we can go outside and be your people of mercy, so that we can go and share your mercy with others so that we can go and be your witnesses and your examples to everybody else, that you love sinners, that you want everybody, that you are the God of mercy. Fill us with your Holy Spirit in this moment. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Our hymn is Higher Ground, and I invite you to stand and we will sing together. As you leave this place today, be filled with the mercy of God. Be filled with the mercy of Jesus Christ so that you can go be his people of mercy out in the world. Go to show mercy. Go to share mercy. Go to pour out God's mercy on everybody else. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.